Hi, hello, good day and good evening everyone and welcome to IVF webinar by Egg Donation Friends. I hope you can all hear us, so please let us know in the chat section if the sound is okay, if you can hear me. I will appreciate this information from you. I'm Sophie and I will be your host today. And we are here together with the world-class fertility experts from Assisting Nature. Dr. Robert Najdecki, co-founder of Assisting Nature and scientific director in the clinic, and Tatiana Hato Masidu, junior clinical embryologist. And the topic is miscarriages and embryo implantation failures and PGTA. The presentation on the topic will take around 30 minutes and after that we will start with the Q&A session. So if you have any questions, you can type those questions in the chat section. So, Assisting Nature, are you ready? Yes, Hello. we are. Yes. Hello. Hi, welcome. Sophie, thank you very much for your pleasant introduction. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to our webinar, Miscarriages and Embryo Implantation Failure versus PGTA. I feel really honored to be invited by the organizers, egg donation friends and IVF media and to have the opportunity to, to exchange my experience and knowledge with you. Working and speaking with professionals is an everyday practice, but discussing with patients about their interests, it's a very important and valuable goal. As Assisting Nature, we are extremely proud to have the opportunity to host such an important event. And like a leaders in innovations, we have this small innovation of the presence of two scientists for our team. Let me introduce our clinical embryologist, Tatiana Hardomacedo. She is here with us and you will have the opportunity to ask her about some uh, special issues about PGTA, about embryology, about genetics. Let's start. The galloping development of science in the areas of biology of a production of genetics, of reproductive medicine, and of all the related fields gives us a new tools and techniques and better understanding of all reproductive processes finally lead us to a higher success rate in the IVF procedures. Trying to bring the topic of our webinar closer, let's talk about the definitions. A miscarriage means the loss of pregnancy and it's occurred in 30% of conceptions and 10% of clinically recognized pregnancies. A recurrent miscarriage means at least two pregnancies lost, one after another, and it occurs in one, two, in one to, to three percent of pregnant women. As you see, we have many multifactorial reasons worry on timing on the loss. Uterine anomalies, endocrine reasons, immunologic reasons, infectious causes, thrombophilias and genetic reasons, embryonic and euploidy. The implantation process depends on many factors, such as uterus cavity environment, embryos quality, embryos euploidity, and failure of this process is caused in many cases specifically by decreased endometrial receptivity due to uterine abnormalities or influence of endometriosis, immune deregulation causes, and embryonic aneuploidity. The term implantation failure can be used to describe a patient who has never shown increased level of HCG or without later ultrasound evidence of gestational sac. Implantation failure can apply to patients undergoing assisted reproduction technology, ART, and patients trying to conceive without any fertility treatment. Repeated implantation failure, REFI, refers to a situation when transferred embryos repeatedly fail to implant despite numerous attempts via assisted reproductive technology.
decreased endometrial receptivity uh, is the decidualization in the functional result of progesterone effect on the endometrium. It is transformation on the endometrial tissue to the morphologically and functionally distinct decidua. Uterine sensitivity to implantation is programmed into three phases, pre-receptive, receptive, and non-receptive. Blastocysts implant only in the receptive phase, which is characterized by unique molecular and morphological changes on the endometrium. The endometrium has an important role in embryo selection. Decidual cells selectively recognize in part embryos and inhibit implantation, and decidualized cells don't mount such a response. The ability of stromal cells to express the decidual phenotype is impaired in women with recurrent miscarriages. Implantation is a very complex process. It is the end. It's the end result of a crosstalk between the decidua and the embryo. This crosstalk involves multiple cell types and molecules. The normally decidualized endometrium can recognize poor embryos. Endometrial selection failure leads to an increased early pregnancy rate with a significant possibility of failure later. So, as we mentioned earlier, uh, genetically abnormal embryos may be the reason for uh, early pregnancy loss and implantation failure. The uh, genetically abnormal embryos may be due, due to unemployment. What does unemployment mean? This means that uh, uh, there is an abnormal number of chromosomes in the cells. Normally, we all have uh, 46 chromosomes in our somatic cells. 23 chromosomes comes, come from our mother and 23 chromosomes come from our father. But if there is a gain of chromosomes, then we have a situation which is called trisomy. And if we have a loss of chromosomes, then we have monosomies. Uh, Aneuploidy can be divided into two sections. The first one is when a whole chromosome is missing or we have one whole chromosome in addition. And secondly, when we have gain or loss of smaller chromosomal parts, and in this situation we have structural or segmental unemployments. So, uh, aneuploidy is the most significant single factor affecting early pregnancy failure and miscarriage, as 65% of the abnormal embryos uh, end in spontaneous miscarriages. And of course, uh, it's also the reason of uh, various congenital disabilities. So, why are there cases of aneuploidies? Well, we have to know that uh, aneuploidy rates are prevalent always in the human gametes and embryos. Especially for women, uh, women have to know that the risk of having aneuploid X is, significant, is significantly increasing with the age of the woman. But there are also cases of men who have unemployed in their sperm. Uh, in addition, there may be a, a reason for uh, aneuploid embryos because the father or the mother have some chromosomal abnormality as well. So this abnormality could be inherited in the embryo, leading to an abnormal embryo. Uh, last but not least, there are cases that uh, some uh, chromosomal errors may be um, created during the embryo cell divisions, which happen after the fertilization. So there are um, um, errors in the embryo cells and not, uh, uh, and not um, in the parent gametes. Sorry. So, okay. sorry, okay. So, especially women have to know that uh, the advanced maternal age is a uh, high, uh, is uh, sig significantly uh, connected with higher risk of unemployment. It's because we can simply say that the age of the woman's sex is the same as her age. So this means that while a woman is increasing, is uh, uh, increase in an increasing age, this means that the quality of the oocyte is diminishing. And this leads to improper chromosomal divisions during the eugenesis. So as you can see in the figure, when a woman is about 34 years old, the rate of abnormal oocytes is about 40%. But as long as she's 
up to 45 years old, this rate may be increased to 70 or even 80 percent. And uh, this uh, increased uh, rate of unemployment of the X leads to increased implantation failure and higher miscarriage rate and lower life birth rate because abnormal unemployed X lead to the creation of abnormal unemployed blastocysts. And abnormal unemployed blastocysts are uh, difficult to result in a pregnancy. So the most frequent unemployed is that we meet in the humans are trisomies of the chromosomes 21, chromosome 20, uh, 18, chromosome 13, and trisomies of the sex chromosomes, XXY, uh, which is the Klinefelder syndrome. And also we have uh, the most common single unemployed uh, is about a monosomy of the X chromosome, which is a sex chromosome, and uh, it results in the Turner syndrome. So what we do in uh, the uh, IVF lab, we do assess the embryos, but we, the assessment we do is, a, is based on the morphological criteria. So we assess the embryos on day three, uh, according to the number of the blastomeres of the cells of the embryo, and according to the fragmentation rate that we see on each embryo. We also uh, assess the embryos on day five to see which embryos have reached and formed the blastocyst and how the morphology of this blastocyst is. But as I've, I've already said, this is just morphologically. We do not know if these embryos are normal or abnormal. We do not know the genetic background of them. Of course, um, an embryo with uh, poor morphology is more likely to be abnormal, uh, but we cannot say that for sure. And uh, on the other hand, a good morphology embryo is not uh, necessarily normal. We cannot know that. We have to keep in mind that almost 50% of the good morphology embryos may be unemployed, and this can be um, approved after genetic testing. But if an embryo is euploid, then it can uh, implant equally at any age. So here you can see that an embryo that has been tested and is euploid can lead to implantation equally uh, in a woman younger than 35 and equally even in women over 42 years old. So how do we do the genetic test? Uh, we do, we perform PGT, which means pre-implantation genetic testing. Uh, maybe uh, most of you have already heard about PGS or PGD. Well, these are the former um, names of the PGT, of the testing, how it is called today. So uh, PGT is divided into three uh, categories nowadays. PGS was the pre-implantation genetic screening, which was screened for chromosomal abnormalities. And now it's named PGTA because we test for unemployity. If we test for uh, other chromosomal structural rearrangements, then we have to perform PGTA SR. And uh, PGD is another thing. It's completely different because it is used to diagnose monogenic diseases on the embryos. Monogenic diseases are some diseases that can be inherited from the parents to the embryos, such as thalassemia, cystic fibrosis, and others. And in this case, we have to perform PGTM to see if the embryo has the disease or not. So we will focus on the PGTA part. Now we have small videos here to present to all the audience. What is the difference between the biopsy on day three, when all the blastomer is picking out, and in day five, when very small amount of uh, cells from trophoctoderm is picking to, uh, to the genetic lab for genetic diagnosis. So here we could see how we opened a hole with a laser, and here we aspirate one blastomer, one of the eight cells of the embryo. And this single cell will be sent for genetic testing. This is biopsy on uh, embryo day five. This, this is a trophectoderm biopsy. We aspirate trophectoderm cells, which are the cells that form the placenta. Here, we cut them with the laser to isolate them. And these cells, this mass of cells, which are about five to 10 cells, are uh, sent for uh, testing. So along with the evolution of the biopsy technique from day three biopsy 
to day five biops nowadays, also the um, genetic methods have uh, evolved, uh, evolved as well. Nowadays, we perform uh, basically next generation sequencing, NGS. This is a new technical possibility that can be applied uh, in a routine basis in a genetic lab. It has really high consistency of about 99.9% with uh, higher resolution and higher sensitivity than uh, the former techniques. And this has led, has, uh, led to improved genetic diagnostics uh, with reduced false positive or false negative re results and can also reveal the mosaicism of the embryos. It's a more cost-effective method and it allows, uh, allows flexibility both to the embryology lab and to the genetic lab to have the results. And once the uh, biopsy is performed, then we have the genetic results in about 20 days. So, uh, we have to keep in mind that PGT is uh, a diagnostic method. It, that it cannot, it does not improve the, reproduct the reproductive potential of an embryo. It cannot repair an embryo. It's just a diag diagnostic method. So, uh, besides that, the limitations of PGTA is that it cannot detect mosaicism under 20%, and rarely, very rarely, but it can happen. There may be embryos that may not give a result after the genetic testing, so we couldn't answer if this embryo is normal or abnormal, but that is extremely rare. Uh, in addition, there may be cases of patients who, which uh, will not have a euploid embryo for transfer after the test. There may be cases that all the embryos are unemployed and cannot be transferred. And in addition, uh, according to the Greek law, we cannot perform sex selection. It is not allowed unless there is a strict medical reason, for example, some excellent disease. So uh, the sex of the embryos is never revealed to us. We cannot choose a female or a male embryo. And last but not least, the Greek law uh, offers, uh, allows to offer IVF treatment in all cases only for women less than 50 years old. So, what can we see in the results of the PGTAs? Here you can see a summary of the results. Well, each line represents a tested embryo. So, the embryo in the first line is an embryo that has been tested by day five biopsy because we can see that the specimen type is blastocyst cell, which is trophectoderm cell. The embryo has been vitrified after the biopsy. And the genetic test that has been performed is NGS, the next generation sequencing. The result for this embryo is that the embryo is abnormal because it has one less 19 chromosome. So this embryo is not recommended for transfer. On the other side, embryo number two, you can see the results on the second line, is again an embryo tested on day five with a two-factor biopsy. It is cryopreserved. It is tested by NGS and the embryo is normal. So this embryo is recommended to be transferred. Uh, uh, normally, we can see other aneuploidies, as we can see on embryo 3, uh, or even mosaicism on the embryos. So, the results show us which embryos are euploid, as the first one uh, in the blue co color, which embryos are aneuploid, which are abnormal, uh, totally abnormal, as the red one, and which embryos are mosaic. These embryos uh, is a category that of embryos that have both euploid and aneuploid cell lines. About 21% of all the blastocysts may be mosaics. So these embryos may be transferable or not according to the level of the mosaicism and according to the chromosomes that are involved in this. But in any case, if we have a normal a euploid embryo, we always transfer the euploid embryo. A mosaic embryo is never the first choice because even it can still be possible to lead to a normal, a normal and viable pregnancy, it usually implants less and miscarry more. So if a couple decides to uh, go for a PGDA IVF treatment, what should they do? Well, first of all, uh, women um, submitted in control ovarian stimulation as usual. Uh, we perform the oocyte pickup and uh, we do the uh, ICSI procedure. And then we check which embryos have formed blastocysts on day five. And these embryos, will be biopsied. So we take a uh, trifactor cells out of the cell, out of the embryo, and these cells are sent to the genetic lab to be tested. Meanwhile, the bi biopsied blastocysts are vitrified in order to be stored 
until we have the results in about three weeks and to know which embryos are euploid and to be transferred. So, uh, what do we do uh, after the results? When we know which embryos are euploid, then uh, the uh, frozen embryo transfer is rearranged and we thought and transfer only euploid embryos, one or two embryos per embryo transfer. Of course, all the surplus euploid embryos can be stored for a subsequent uh, embryo transfer in the future. Uh, and uh, if this tested euploid embryo leads to a pregnancy, then uh, the woman has to uh, follow all the standard routine prenatal tests. Uh, what happens to the uh, rest unemployed embryos then? Uh, if the couple decides, uh, they, can, uh, sign, they can sign a consent uh, in order to uh, destroy all the abnormal embryos that cannot be transferred. So for us, nowadays, the gold standard for BGTA is to perform a trophectoderm biopsy on day five, to vitrify all the blastos that are biopsied, to perform PGTA with next generation sequencing, and then to perform preferably single embryo transfer. So uh, most of the couples are concerned about uh, the effects that uh, the biopsy may have on the embryo. Of course, the embryo biopsy is an interventional method and is dependent on the manipulator. Uh, in addition, every center, every, uh, every IVF clinic may have different biopsy techniques, but it always has to be performed by highly trained and highly experienced staff. In this way, we can minimize the adverse effects to almost none. Almost none embryos uh, will be harmed by the biopsy. Of course, we have to keep in mind also that we obtain only to factor them cells. As we said, these cells are the cells that produce, that form the placenta. We do not take cells that, we, that will develop into the fetus. Uh, in addition, uh, the embryos are freezed uh, with the vitrification process, which is uh, highly effective, as uh, the survival rates after the thawing is up to 98%. And after that, when we have to uh, perform the embryo transfer, the frozen embryo transfer, the thawing of the euploid embryos is performed as usual. Nothing is different than the other cases. So, um, who should have, who should follow an IVF PGTA uh, treatment? Uh, as we said, uh, PGTA is strongly recommended in women with advanced maternal age because, as we said, there is an increased risk of uh, abnormal uh, aneuploid eggs. Uh, in addition, it is um, recommended in couples with severe male factor, uh, which may be uh, indicated by sperm fish or high sperm DNA fragmentation. Uh, also for couples with recurrent scourges and recurrent implantation failures. And of course, uh, PGT uh, has, uh, is uh, recommended also for couples with uh, a known chromosomal abnormality, with a, a known uh, abnormality in their karyotypes. And what about the patient counseling? Very extremely important for couples to have counseling before and after treatment, before the treatment assessment of couples' reproductive history. Are there any known parental chromosomal abnormalities? Assessment of parental karyotype. Are there indications for PGTA? What are the implications of aneuploidy for a pregnancy? What are the associated risks? What are the reproductive options? IVF, IVF with PGTA, donor gametes, and after treatment also. Genetic counseling for results interpretation. Explore the best personalized strategy. One or two embryos. Time of transfer. Discuss all the options in case of no euploid embryo. And what are the advantages of PGTA? Increases implantation rates. Decreases clinical loss rates increase live birth rates, reduces time to pregnancy, eliminates transfer of embryos which don't give viable pregnancy or abnormal pregnancy, decreases emotional cost, very important, of failed transfers, pregnancy loss, including lower costs, decreases multiple pregnancy, single euploid embryo transfer, decreases time in treatment from OPU to embryo transfer, resulting in live birth, 
may explain previous IVF failures and encourages couples to continue treatment. Limited therapeutic options for couples with recurrent unemployed loss, PGDA, may be very useful. Should PGTA be offered in IVF treatment with donor gametes? Possible scenarios. Donor eggs with husband sperm. Patient eggs plus donor sperm. Donor eggs plus donor sperm. Any PGTA indications for partners' gametes. Parental chromosomal anomaly, sperm fish. Age of partner. The couple just wish to avoid transfer of aneuploid embryos and decrease time to successful treatment. Donors, young, healthy, and screened, but still may produce aneuploid embryos, yet in a lower rate. 40% aneuploidy in under 35 years old embryos. And our PGTA in assisting nature. Limited potential risk to the embryos. Only day five biopsy, trophoctoderm biopsy. Detects mosaicism. Only euploid embryos transferred. Single embryo transfer. Time lapse monitoring. Here is our results in autology cycles. Let. So, uh, explain. in uh, this case, we can see the results on the autologous cycles. As you can see, um, out of the uh, women that have followed PGTA, 46% had euploid embryos to be transferred, and 54% had no embryo transfer because no embryos were uh, euploid. But uh, out of the women who had uh, euploid embryos for transfer, we can see the results uh, as uh, you can see, the positive uh, pregnancy test could be uh, even higher than 7% uh, in ages 35 to 39, the clinical pregnancy rate higher than 65%, and the ongoing or live birth rate higher than 60%. This is very important uh, information to our patients and s statistics, and here 54% of patients didn't have the embryo transfer due to an euploidy of the embryos. But this is very transparent for doctors, for our staff, and for our patients. That is impossible to have a pregnancy with an euploid embryos. Very important fact. And uh, here we can see the results uh, of PGTA in egg donation cycles. Uh, of course, we are talking uh, donor eggs with an age less than 32 years old. And in this case, all patients, all acceptors had euploid embryos for transfer. And uh, out of these patients, uh, more than 80% had positive HZ rate and more than 75% had achieved live birth rate. And the conclusions. PGTA, invasive technique extreme precision in handling high embryology skills, no harm for the embryo, useful and precise genetic results, improve IVF outcomes, higher clinical pregnancy rate per ET, lower miscarriage rate per ET, and higher live birth rate per ET. Thank you very much for your attendance. And thank you for the presentation as well. And now we will jump to the Q&A section and we will take a look for the questions. And the first question will be, is it possible to defreeze a frozen fertilized egg cell for PGT and freeze it again after cell removal for later egg cell transfer? Does the cell viability of the embryo decrease as a result of the double freezing? Yes, absolutely, uh, absolutely, yes. First of all, it's possible, uh, but uh, the golden standard and the golden technique is to take the fresh eggs, uh, proceed into the fertilization process, and uh, in day five, uh, proceed into the all genetic uh, tests 
like a PGTA. This is the golden standard. And then freeze the embryos, freeze the blastocysts. This is the, the highest results, and this is absolutely uh, the golden standard here now in uh, IVF treatment. That the answer is that, of course, it's possible, but uh, the results uh, are not the same because froze and froze thought and then still uh, perform the testing PGT. PGTA testing is uh, invasive for the embryos. That if we don't have any other possibilities, uh, yes, it's possible. But we prefer absolutely uh, perform all the project from the beginning and to uh, and to uh, have the blastocyst, fresh blastocyst, then biops biopsy, and afterward. Uh, vitrified by blastocysts. Yes, and thank you for this answer. And we will take the next one. Is a frozen, not fertilized egg cell of the same quality as fresh egg cell? You explained that maybe. And are the fertilization and implantation rates of fresh and cryoconserved eggs comparable? Uh, of course, uh, there is a small difference and uh, I, I can tell it again that we prefer use the fresh eggs but now with uh, vitrification techniques and uh, time-lapse incubators um, our results are uh, absolutely uh, very very close and very near uh, talking about the eggs, uh, the eggs frozen or the eggs fresh but we still prefer fresh eggs. Thank you for explaining this. Let's move on to the next one. Is PGT the same as PGS and PGD? Well, PGS and PGD uh, were the former names for what we now call PGD. PGT is uh, subdivided in three categories. PGTA tests for aneuploidies, as we did in the past with PGS, we were screening for chromosomes. PGTSR is screening for chromosomal abnormalities, but in smaller regions of the chromosomes. And PGD is something different. PGD is diagnosis, a preimplantation genetic diagnosis, like we say today, PGTM, because we can diagnose monogenic diseases. That's why the N, PGTM. Monogenic diseases, as we said, are diseases diseases that can be inherited by the parents and are, um, uh, can be caused by a single gene, like uh, the various types of thalassemias, uh, cystic fibrosis, and others. So PGD uh, includes PGS and PGD. These two were the former uh, names of the technique. And we will then take the next question. Is there any work being done to determine the success rate of vary, varying types of mosaicism? So, as we said, uh, we never prefer to transfer a mosaic embryo if we have a euploid embryo. Uh, in any case, uh, not all mosaic embryos uh, are transferable. The, if we can transfer a mosaic or not, it depends on uh, the percent of the mosaicism and of course, uh, the kind of the abnormalities that are implicated. So uh, if we have a high mosaicism, mosaicism rate, then this embryo cannot be transferred. But uh, this um, is uh, usually um, an, uh, a personalized situation in each patient because we have to see and we have to assess with the geneticist which uh, uh, mosaic embryos can be transferred or cannot be transferred. But uh, in any case, we have some practical issues here. And uh, now we have uh, our patient uh, who proceed uh, after many unsuccessful attempts into the stimulation uh, and after afterward with uh, PGTA. And in the end, we had two embryos, the one absolutely euploid, 
normal and the second embryos embryo uh, was mosaic in in a very small uh, amount but percentage but uh, mosaic in the first embryo transfer and uh, even after uh, hysteroscopic scratching and um, preparation it was unsuccessful and we haven't uh, pregnancy but our patients um, stay with us and continue with us and in the second embryo transfer with this mosaic uh, embryo uh, this embryo transfer was successful and now we are ending the pregnancy of course after many many uh, other tests and uh, and um, nipped and uh, amniocentesis to be absolutely sure that all is uh, properly going properly um, it's looked looked like that uh, the pregnancy is going very very well normally and we are now waiting for delivery that uh, the conclusion is that even uh, mosaic embryos can lead to the normal pregnancy and um, we like such like a clinicians um, must uh, think about it uh, very positively and um, this is absolutely uh, possible to do thank you for this explanation as well and then we will take the next question because pgt is a, such a new technique is it risky? How do we know that there will be no abnormalities or complication for the child later on in life? Well, PGT, as we said, it is an invasive method, uh, but uh, it is usually, it is always uh, performed by highly experienced uh, staff, by highly experienced uh, embryologists with uh, highly skills. So uh, the harm on the embryo is minimized to almost none. Uh, so, uh, if uh, an embryo is tested and is deployed and leads to a pregnancy, it can lead to uh, the live birth of a healthy child. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, many studies are uh, still um, uh, trying to evaluate uh, the effects and the follow-up of these uh, children. Of course, we have many years in front of us uh, to know what a complication may be in the child of a life, of, uh, in, in the future uh, life. But uh, since all the tests are uh, performed, uh, usually, I mean, all the prenatal tests, then we can be sure about the uh, health of this child. Of course, and as we very well know, when the new technique is developing, uh, there are many, many uh, doubts and uh, many uh, problems but uh, if we remember when the ICSI was introduced into the, practi into the practice uh, there were many many doubts and uh, um, all people all the scientific uh, community were, were very um, uh, were very sure. concerned about it and now, of course, after after 15, 20 years, it's absolutely basic routine technique without any problems. And now to proceed into the classical IVF is uh, probably only for scientific reasons, not for the routine uh, work in the in the lab. Then um, actually, it's all developing. And uh, first of all, the technique. The technique uh, from day three, when all the blastomer is uh, putting out from the from the embryo, and going to the day five technique, when small amount of cells from the from the uh, from the outer um, part of the embryo is uh, is using for for the genetic uh, tests. This is a very, very big difference. And um, all other feeling is that uh, this is very, um, very potential technique. And probably in five years from here, all, all the IVF cycles will be, will be 
uh, will be done with will be will be uh, proceed with uh, with BGDA because this is transparency and there are the answers for for the patients and for doctors. Uh, without this knowledge, uh, there is very difficult to say um, where is the reason of unsuccessful uh, attempt. Uh, the reason is in the uterus, the, the reason is uh, in the skills of the doctor or uh, in the genetic uh, background of the embryo. Uh, this information gives us uh, absolutely absolute transparency. If the embryos are euploid and morphologically proper, uh, we, must, we must look for another reasons inside the uterus, proceed into the hysteroscopies, proceed into the, uh, another test. Uh, this is very important for the clinical, for, from the clinical point of view. Uh, and of course, uh, for, uh, for the successful uh, happy ending for other patients. Yes, and thank you for the detailed answer. We will take a look for the next question. Is there a dependency between egg quality and stimulation level? Low stimulus, good quality, and high stimulus equal poor quality? Uh, of course, there are some uh, relationships between the quality of the eggs and quality of the maturation process during the stimulation uh, period. Uh, but of course, it uh, depends on age. Um, this is very, very important factor. If a woman is younger, this relationship is uh, absolutely, um, absolutely not visible for us. But uh, during uh, during thirties um, or forties, uh, of course, uh, there is a relationship between uh, quality of uh, eggs and uh, and stimulation process. Very high doses of uh, gonadotropins uh, are not in the in the all uh, in the all cases. Uh, good for uh, quality uh, quality eggs pickups. That it must be all um, it all be it must be all personalized and all this um, stimulation probably must be based on AMH level and on uh, FSH LH levels. Then uh, we can. Um, prepare the, the proper stimulations. Uh, in the age uh, of 20, of 35, over to 35 or 40s, uh, of course, uh, there are very popular um, stimulation protocols with mild stimulation or minimal IVF stimulation or even natural cycle managed with uh, a little amount of uh, medicines. Uh, this is very popular now and uh, it looks like that uh, we have uh, very good results uh, using these protocols. Thank you for your answer and we will take the next question. What do you think of the new research that is being done to the test the fluid around the embryo rather than the actual cells for testing PGT? Well, this would be the ideal solution for uh, all of us because it would be non-invasive at all. We could test the embryos uh, only by the fluid of the embryo culture. Uh, but uh, many studies have to be, have to be performed uh, to be sure about these results. It's uh, something new, it's a new idea, and we have to see how uh, this research will uh, lead to the new era, maybe, of the PGT. Uh, this is absolutely uh, probably future of the IVF lab. Um, also, uh, as we remember uh, in, in, uh, during the pregnancy, uh, in the past, we uh, performed only amniocentesis. That very invasive technique, uh, pick up the fluid with, with uh, embryo cells, 
and then uh, it was possible to uh, test it for the karyotype. Now we use non-invasive prenatal test, NIPT, uh, which is uh, using uh, the fraction, the fet fetal fraction from the blood of mother. And uh, at the moment, we have a possibility to detect um, abnormalities in all 23 uh, chromosomes. That, uh, this is the progress of science. Probably here, the same, uh, the same progress uh, will be possible in, in some years. But now it, uh, it's, it's a future. It's not a technique which is, uh, which is um, ready for use in the labs uh, today, nowadays. Yes, and speaking about the future, we have the next question. Do you foresee or anticipate PGTA becoming standard of care in IVF? Well, we have seen that the uh, PGTA uh, can uh, minimize the failed embryo transfer, the, the failed embryo transfers, and um, uh, in addition, it can increase uh, all the uh, IVF success rates. I mean, uh, the positive uh, rate, the on ongoing, uh, the clinical pregnancy rate, and the ongoing or live birth rate. So, uh, PGTA could be a standard in uh, IVF care in the future, but uh, I think that we have um, much uh, more to see until we uh, reach this stage, because uh, it's um, it's still a cost cost effective uh, method, of course, but it has uh, a cost not uh, only uh, economically, uh, but uh, also, um, since it's an invasive technique, we cannot forget this thing, even if we minimize the effects on the embryo. So maybe it's in the near future, PGTA standard of care in the IVF, but I don't think it is right now. Yes, of course, but uh, now in our unit, we try to, uh, to develop, to build the, the new procedures which are based on the fact that if we will have the one uh, IVF uh, attempt uh, not resulted in pregnancy, I mean uh, embryo transfer not resulted in pregnancy, then we are thinking very seriously about, about PGTA. And uh, if we don't have the, another frozen embryos in the, in the next cycle, we absolutely advise our patients to try uh, PGTA testing. This is, uh, uh, and I think that um, now in our lab, uh, our results uh, allow us to think that uh, this is really uh, very important for patients and uh, this, is, this is the answer for all of us. Uh, what was the reason of uh, failed uh, previous, uh, previous attempts. Yes, and thank you a lot for giving us uh, your answer and opinion. And now we will take the next one. What are the main reasons for a euploid embryo uh, failing to implant? Uh, the euploid uh, embryo is also the normal embryo. And uh, there are many other factors uh, involving the process of implantation. Uh, of course, uh, there are uh, ut uh, uterine reasons like small anatomical variations in the, in the, in the uterus, in the cavity, um, uh, the process of um, uh, endometrial um, stimulation, that there are also many reasons to have uh, no positive results. Uh, generally, we count that the euploid embryo, this is over 50, 60 percent possibility to have a normal pregnancy. This is the biology and uh, this is the human body. Uh, unfortunately, it's not uh, a machine 
uh, where all these things are absolutely clear and uh, developed. Yes, thank you a lot for the answer. And now we will take the next question, which is, does genetic testing create designer babies? <laughs> There is, a, there is a very great discussion and a very deep discussion about uh, eugenic uh, world and uh, it, if it is uh, future, our future or not. In our opinion, in my opinion, um, the PGTA, it's a very, very clear and, uh, and ethically uh, normal procedure. We are talking about uh, the chromosomes and about um, some abnormalities uh, which are in the in the humans uh, all these years that uh, to create uh, the embryos and to create the pregnancy with chromosomal abnormalities, in my opinion, is absolutely um, not uh, able and not uh, acceptable uh, in our time uh, nowadays. Uh, this is uh, not uh, babies design, designing or eugenic. We are talking about a very strictly normal uh, process of testing of the embryos and to, to have uh, only uh, normally genetically embryos it's not uh, in not it's not designing babies yes and thank you a lot for the answer as well as a question and the next question for you will be this one i think it's often asked question do you think that pgt can be valuable in ivf programs with donor eggs at least for somebody who had implantation problems in the past uh, absolutely yes. Uh, we are uh, advise our patients uh, if there is uh, financial support because it's an uh, expensive technique to use PGTA in the donation cycles because uh, except the uh, younger donors, there are all normal factors which influence uh, the pregnancy, the successful pregnancy rate. That it's very important also to, to have this information in the case of donation cycles. Yes, of course, it's valuable. It's, uh, it's uh, better for our patients to perform only uh, euploid with uh, embryo transfer only with euploid embryos. Um, of course, from the financial point, point of view, not to not to proceed, not to continue two, three, four embryo transfer, uh, looking for a good embryos without any informations. Um, that, um, in our opinion, is a very valuable test, also for egg donations uh, cycles. And uh, actually, we. We, we offer to our patients uh, some packages and we have the package with euploid embryos. The next question we will take a look is why do some non-euploid embryos implant and then miscarry? Why do they not all fail to implant? Well, actually some non-euploid embryos do implant uh, because they have some um, chromosomal abnormality that uh, may not be the problem for the implantation, but as the embryo develop, develops, then this abnormality uh, may, be not, may not be viable for uh, a human being. So when the embryo reaches such a stage, then the pregnancy uh, ends. So it depends on the uh, chromosomal abnormality, on uh, which chromosomes uh, are implicated and uh, how maybe how how many genes, how much genetic information there is on these chromosomes? There are many factors around this uh, topic. Thank you, thank you for the answer. And the next question. 
will be this one. What happens with the embryos which are not healthy? I mean, if they have any aneuploidies on the test results. So um, if uh, we have aneuploid embryos, then these embryos are not recommended to be transferred. We cannot transfer these embryos because there will be not healthy embryos. We do not want and we cannot do this. So uh, these embryos uh, are being uh, stored since the biopsy and until we have the genetic results. Then when we can see from uh, the uh, results of the genetic lab that these embryos are unemployed, the couple can and has to decide uh, if they want to destroy these embryos or uh, if they want to offer these embryos uh, to be uh, used for research, but they cannot be uh, transferred. So the couple decides actually to uh, destroy or offer the embryos to the science. Thank you for explaining this to us. And uh, yeah, we have uh, all the questions asked, but somebody is typing, so we, we will just wait if the question comes up. Yes, and there is a question. If you have any questions, please type them uh, in the chat section. This is the final call for the questions. But in the meantime, we will take a look for the next one. Can couple keep embryos frozen at the bank? You mean uh, tested embryos? I mean the embryos with aneuploidies. No, it, it, it's impossible. Uh, because the embryos are uh, in the cryobank and uh, the responsibility for the embryos is uh, in the unit and in the uh, cryobank uh, director. That uh, the only possibilities is this uh, which we discussed about... Uh, destroying the yes. unemployed embryos. First, of, first is destroying the embryos. The second is uh, giving these embryos for uh, scientific research and, and uh, the third is giving this embryo for educational uh, purposes to uh, train our embryologists uh, with, with some procedures. This is three options. Of course, since this is a genetic material of uh, a couple, the couple has to sign about this option. Absolutely. In any case, we cannot do anything in the embryos without uh, your consent. Yes, and thank you for your answer. Uh, we are still waiting for the questions. Some, somebody is typing, so we will take a second. If not, we will be slowly finishing. But uh, as I said, it will be the final call for uh, the questions. Um, I would like to thank all of you for attendance and for the presentation, Assisting Nature, Dr. Robert and Tatiana. Uh, Very much. Yes. Uh, if any questions will not be asked here, we will forward every question uh, to Assisting Nature. If you throw us email, I just put the email address in the chat section. So if you uh, do have any questions, please remember that we will forward everything to Assisting Nature afterwards. So yes, as we don't have any questions coming up, I think that we will be finishing our today's webinar and i will then thank you a lot everybody thank you dr uh, robert and tatiana and thank you huge thank you <laughs> from everybody and uh, also uh, thank you for all of you who was today with us uh, it was a pleasure to have you here and thank you one more time uh, assisting nature if you have any final words to add please do that uh, thank you. It was a pleasure. We hope that we answered all your questions and uh, uh, you have uh, taken all the 
important information for you. Yes, all your answer was very helpful, helpful and your explanation was also uh, great for this complicated stuff and matters which are connected to IVF. Of course, thank you everybody and please join, subscribe and follow us all the information about the rewatch and about the next webinars are uh, available on our website. If you need to share it with anybody who need to see that, please do that. And it will be a great pleasure to uh, meet you all here next week, next Tuesday. See you here. Good night, good day, wherever you are. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye -bye.